To declare a function in Swift, use the func keyword, followed by the function name, and then a pair of curly braces, like this. So here I've got a greet function, I'm just going to say uh, print hello, and then you can call that just by passing in an empty pair of parentheses here, and this is a way to encapsulate behavior and call it many times. Now in Swift terminology, you call this a freeform function because it's sort of not attached to any other object. Uh, you might also add these to classes, in which case you would call them methods, but the semantics are largely the same. And sometimes we'll use the terminology function and method interchangeably, but essentially a function is uh, not in the context of a class. So we just have this function greet, we can call it from anywhere, and we have it here. So you might also want to have it take arguments. So I'm going to pass in an argument called name, and name is going to be a string. So the idea here is that you have the label first, or the identifier, and followed by a colon, and then the type annotation of what type you expect there. So if I do this now, greet can no longer be called. Notice that it's not getting to this line. In fact, Xcode should be showing me an error right now. Uh, it can't get to that line because I'm not calling it properly. So what I need to do is pass in a string here. So I'm just going to say Ben. And then here I can say hello and use string interpolation to pull in the name there. So instead of printing out the, the string we created here, we might instead choose to return this value from the function, in which case then we could have our greeting be returned from the greet function like this. Now in order to ret return things, after the argument list, you pass an arrow, and then followed by the type that you're going to be returning, and then finally this returns hello Ben. Now it's typical convention to have the first argument be also specified as part of the function name. So here I'm going to say greet with name. And then you can also have other arguments here. So I can specify a suffix, which is also going to be a string. So here I'm going to pass in the suffix. And now I need to pass in that a second argument. And in a language like Ruby or, or uh, Python or C Sharp or most languages, you just uh, specify the next argument with a comma. But in Swift, you have to name the arguments. So here I'm going to say suffix like that. Now it's curious that we didn't have to name the first one, and that's just by convention. By convention, the first one is partially named with the function name. So I say greet with name. I already specified that that first argument is going to be a name. So this first argument doesn't need what's called an external identifier. When we're calling this function, we don't need to specify the identifier for that first argument because it's assuming that we'll have a good name for it as part of our method name. But the second argument does, and so we need to specify that. So the name of this function is greet with name suffix. Greet with name suffix. It's, this, it's basically the joining of all of these parts, the method name or the function name, and all of the argument labels. Now there is a way to get Swift to change that behavior slightly. So if we wanted to have an external name for this, then I can specify that external name before my label here, and then it would force me to pass that in. And just to drive the point home, I could change this internal name to n, and this should be a little bit more clear that this first value is the external identifier, and the second value is the internal identifier that is internal to this function. So that's if we wanted to force the, every argument to have a label, we'd specify it like this. Now I don't, I'm just gonna stick with the defaults, and the default is the first argument doesn't have a label. Let's say we didn't want a label for the second argument either. Right, we could have a, we could have a, uh, a, a different name here if we wanted to, just like this, that, that defines the external identifier. But if we didn't want to use one at all, then you can use an underscore, and an underscore is basically ignore it, in which case we sort of call it like a standard C function. Methods could also take multiple arguments, and they could also return multiple arguments. So let's say we have a, uh, a min-max function that takes in an array of ints. So I'm going to take in something called array. It's going to be an array of integers, and it's going to return two things. I want to return two things, and I want to return a min int, and a max int of this array. 
Okay, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say we have a min value, and that's just going to be array sub zero, and we have a max value, which is going to be array sub zero. Then we're going to loop over all the items in the array. So I'm going to use array slicing. We found out uh, last in the first episode on types. So I'm going to take that array, and I'm going to go from the first index all the way up to, but not including the last uh, or the array count. Then we're going to check to see if our item is greater than our max. Then we're going to set the max to that item. Then we're going to check to see if item is less than our min. And we're going to set our min to that item. And then when we're done, we're just going to return min and max. OK, so if I call min max and I pass in an array of, say, 1, 10, negative 2, 44, 3, see what result we get. Notice how I get a tuple back that is uh, minus 2 for the min and 44 for the max. So it looks like it's working. A problem with this at the moment because if we take a look at the type of this uh, property, we're actually doing array uh, indexing without checking the array length. And so this is an area where our program could crash. If we don't have an item at array uh, index 0, then our program's going to crash. If I take uh, min max on an empty array, what's going to happen? We're going to get an error there. So we want to avoid those types of crashes. So here I'm going to change this, and I need to make our tuple optional here in order to have the safety to check to see if we even have a value there. So here we can say if array dot is empty, return nil. So this is one way we could do that. Another way is to use a Swift 2 feature called guard. And guard is a way of verifying your input at the beginning of a method and or beginning of a function and return early. So what we can say is guard against some condition. Otherwise, we can return nil. And this is another way of formalizing that. We'll get more into guard and defer later on. But now we've protected ourselves against calling min max on an empty array. We'll see what we get. We get back nil. So if I want to check to see what the values are, I can say if let results equals min max, then I can say result.min and result.max. That will pull out those values. And it's pulling out these min and max value labels because I specified them like this. Uh, another way you could do that is you could just destructure it right here. So you could say if let min max. And this is called destructuring assignment. It's going to match the tuple return value from min max, stuffed the left hand side into min and the right hand side into max, and it still works. And just to know, just so you know that the names don't really matter here, it's all it's purely positional. So whatever the tuple is being returned by the method, uh, that will get matched to whatever tuple you provide here. So let's talk a little bit about uh, ex extensions. This is a way for you to attach functions onto existing types. So say I have a, a function of um, print message, and we've got a message which is a string. And here we're just going to say, I want to print that message some number of times, which is going to be an int. So here I could say for, uh, I could say for i in zero dot dot less than times. Here I'm going to print that message. And then we could say print message ho three times. And then if we take a look in the debug area, we get ho ho ho. Okay, another interesting thing here is that we're not using this value i, and the compiler is warning us that we didn't ever use it. So we can replace that with an underscore indicating to the compiler that we're not going to use that item. Okay, so there's a couple of things interesting about this. One is the number of times is, is an interesting concept that we could pull apart from this. And what to do is printing a message is sort of oddly specific. So it'd be kind of nice if we could extract this out into two different things. Uh, one of them... It would be nice if we could create something a little bit more expressive, like five times do something. And we can actually do that by creating an extension on the int type. So here I'm going to say times. And now times has to take an argument. That argument is going to be a closure. A closure looks like a function. 
if you look at a function uh, do something, and it's going to take in the number, and it's going to return nothing, in which case it's going to return void. We can obviously leave that off, but the shape of this function, the shape of this function is something to look at. So the shape is it takes some arguments and it returns some arguments. In this case, uh, this describes a closure that takes nothing and returns nothing. So it's your basic function with no arguments. Uh, in this case, we have a function that takes an int and returns nothing. So that's what this do something method is. Uh, now here we could just say print our our message here, whatever we want to do, we could do that, and then we can inside of our times function we can take in a closure that matches this shape. So here I'm going to say I'm going to call it a block, and the type is going to be something that takes an int and returns nothing. So this em empty uh, parens is the same as doing void. And you'll see this sort of interchangeably. I tend to prefer the parentheses because I'm going to be typing them anyway, and I might want to change that to return something. In any case, uh, empty parentheses are the same as typing uh, void. So here I, I'm going to be passing in a closure that takes an int and returns nothing. And then for each time in that list, I'm basically just going to copy this loop and here, instead of saying times, I'm going to use self, because self is the integer. It's the number. Uh, then I have uh, my number here, n, which I'm now going to use, and I'm going to call that block and pass it in. So basically, I've just encapsulated the notion of iterating a number of times over, um, over a loop. And then I can call this five times, and I can pass in do something. Now do something, if I just type the name and I don't actually call it with parentheses, this is passing it in almost like a function pointer. So notice that when I said five times do something, it actually did it. So we can actually take this and put it in line here by using uh, curly braces to denote a closure. And the interesting thing about Swift is that your Arguments to a closure come inside the curly braces. So here I'm going to specify n, which is an int, in. And this in is the keyword that separates the argument list to the closure to the body. And then here I can say I want to print uh, hi. And I'll change the number there. And then we'll just take a look at the debug area, and it's printing hi 15 times. OK, so now for some cleanup. There's a lot of syntax here that is unnecessary that could be inferred by the compiler. So the first thing is this type here. If I get rid of this type annotation, n is still going to be an integer. Why? How does it know this? It knows this because the times function, this times method rather, since it's an extension on int, it takes a block that is of that type. So the compiler's inferring that n is going to be an int. We can also omit these parentheses. We really only use those if we're going to be specifying the type, or if we have multiple types, etc. You don't really need them. So we're cleaning this up a little bit further. Uh, the next thing I'd like to do is, in Swift, if the last argument to a method is a closure, then you can lift that argument out of the argument list and pass it as a trailing block instead. So what I mean by that is I'm going to take this parentheses here, this parent, and I'm going to close it like this. And so basically I've just lifted the closure outside of the method argument list. It's still being passed in as block, but Swift allows us to do this because block is the last argument to this method, and it's a closure. And when the only argument to a method is a closure, you can omit passing in open and close parens, and now you just have 15 times like this. And I think this is really expressive. Now, obviously, we're not using this, uh, this value. Let's say I wanted to stuff it in there uh, so that we can actually see the number. And then I can make one more addition. If it is uh, not harmful to readability, I can, instead of declaring uh, the named 
uh, variables there, I can use $0 for the first argument to that closure. Now I think it's easy to go too far with this because that uh, isn't always obvious what we're doing. But uh, in this case, I think it is pretty obvious that that's going to be the number uh, that we're iterating over. So that's a look at Swift functions. Hope you learned something from this episode, and we'll see you again next time.